hooking up the store. It's the National Lottery Star 2016. Please welcome your host, John Barrowman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for another year of celebrating the wonderful causes funded by the National Lottery. For over 20 years, the National Lottery has generated a whopping 35 billion pounds and helped more than 490,000 projects throughout the UK. Tonight, in association with The Telegraph and with a little help from a whole host of celebrity friends, we'll be honoring your favorite projects. Now, for months, You've been voting in your thousands. The votes have been counted and verified on behalf of the National Lottery. We have seven fantastic categories with seven worthy winners. All have done inspirational work in their communities throughout the UK. And at the end of the night, we'll also be handing out one extra special award. And trust me, you do not want to miss that. On top of it all, We'll be welcoming some of Team GB right here on this very stage, fresh from their incredible success at this year's Olympic Games. But first, I think we should get this party started with some music, right? Yes! Once a part of chart-topping boy band The Wanted, he's now enjoying success both here and across the pond in the U.S. as a solo artist. With Twist. Please give it up for Nathan Sykes!
Now we are all well and truly warmed up. Let's get to our first award of the night, which is for the winners of the Heritage category. And here to present it is an author and chef who has certainly got the recipe for success. It includes a handful of red tomatoes, some green peppers, plus a pinch of Susie salt and Percy pepper. <laughs> Ready, steady, and clap, everybody, for Ainsley Harriet. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, as a chef, I'm always interested to know where my ingredients come from. So it was a real treat for me to be able to visit the Lion Salt Works in Cheshire. In its heyday back in 1894, it was a real monument to the salt making industry. So I hopped on my Victorian DeLorean and took a trip back in time to see what it was all about. All aboard! To 1894. Okay, so it's not real time travel, but this place is the next best thing. This Victorian salt works first opened in 1884, and it's hard to believe that the production of the biggest salt works in the UK stopped here 30 years ago, leaving this amazing place in disrepair. The Lion Salt Works project has been about bringing this whole site back to life. It's so much a part of the local community, and more than that, so much a part of Cheshire and the history of Cheshire. It's taken four years, hundreds of man hours, and 10 million pounds to restore this grade two listed building into the most incredible museum and in doing so, preserving a key part of our industrial history. Last time I was here, it was absolutely derelict. It was just a, a tin shed, virtually, and it, it's absolutely brilliant now. Brilliant. It's great that it's been preserved through the restoration programme and the extra funding that is being given will help the salt works be a major attraction for people to come and visit yeah. both old and young we consider this not just to be a museum for visitors from all over the country and all over the world this is actually a community hub for us because there is so much that goes on here it really is a wonderful facility the salt works offer interactive learning programs spectacular sound and light shows, a butterfly garden and access to the canal, all in one beautifully restored area. Winning this Heritage Award is just incredible for us. Um, I think it's extra special because it was part of a public vote and we can reach out and tell people, actually, what we have here is really special. Please come and see it. It's lovely on a day like today to see the site being used by so many different people, see the children enjoying it. It's not just, just a museum, it's something that's part of the community. Do you know, this exhibition centre is truly a worthy winner of the Heritage Award, and I hope that it's here for many, many years to come, so people can enjoy the experience. <laughs> On behalf of the Lion Thought Works, please welcome Catherine West and Nick Hunt. <laughs> At the start of this project, our restoration team said that this was the worst building they'd ever seen anywhere in the world. Um, and now, the Lion Salt Works is the most fantastic museum. Thank you to the Lion Salt Works Trust for their vision, to Heritage Lottery Fund and the Cheshire West and Chester Council for support, which was incredible. Thank you to everybody who's worked on our project. And I'd say to you, please come and experience this amazing piece of history that you've helped us restore and bring back to life. Thank you. It's time to get those creative juices flowing with the arts category. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I am a very quiet, reserved soul. <laughs> so a nice, peaceful library is my idea of heaven. Yeah, right. But the project winners in the arts category had their own ideas of what a library should be, and it's the place I want to go. Here to tell us more is actor Ralph Little.
Good evening. So, uh, libraries. They conjure up an image of hundreds of books and quiet. But when I went to visit one in St Helens, uh, it was a totally different story. Uh, in fact, it was so far removed from what you'd expect in a library, you'd have to see it to believe it, and indeed, uh, I certainly did. So, let's take a look. This is Cultural Hubs. It's an arts project in St Helens that takes the traditional image of a library as a place with uh, hushed books and quiet study and turns that image on its head. Quite literally. Cultural Hubs is an arts in libraries programme that animates our 13 libraries in St Helens with performance and participatory arts activities. All that you really need to access great creativity is a library card. Cultural Hubs is a real example of what you can do if you really believe in the flexibility of a library space. It's non-judgmental. We welcome everybody with open arms. The last thing you expect is like a lot of guys in here break dancing, giving it tons. Was it a weird step for you to make that, to, to make this journey here? We did scare a lot of old people. They was not expecting break bet, dancers yeah. in the library in the morning. But the reception from uh, the crowds in the libraries was really good. Right. And it's something that we really want to, to do more of in the future. Yeah. Right, come on then, let's do it. Yeah. One, two, drop, down, up. As the programme has developed, we've appealed to a lot of people with mental health issues. Um, they found either watching some of the performances or taking part of them very cathartic. From Johnny Wellies to Johnny Vegas, Beecham's pills for ills that plagued us. Lynn has severe anxiety, depression, OCD and panic attacks, which can leave her reluctant to go anywhere. I've always felt quite worthless, but Everything that happened once I did muster the courage to walk through the doors was a wonderful, liberating feeling. But most importantly, I hope that by my standing there, I can help other people, because that's when I feel I have worth. It's in our history and in our blood to help the other as families should. The Cultural Hubs programme really is like CPR for the soul. What could be better than that? When I was a kid, a library like this would be the last place you'd expect to find such a buzz and make so many new friends and connections. So Cultural Hubs is a commendable winner of the Arts Award, creating a new chapter in the way we use UK libraries. <laughs> From Cultural Hubs, please welcome Sue Williamson and Owen Hutchins. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who voted for us. I'm absolutely thrilled to accept this award. It wouldn't have been possible without all the National Lottery players, so thank you to them and to everybody involved in this project, which has helped us to bring great art to the people of St Helens in our libraries. Thank you again. Up next is our third award, which is for Voluntary Charity. And here to present it is a broadcaster and journalist who is the face of the BBC proms. Well, she's certainly music to my ears. Please welcome Katie Durham. Good evening, everyone. When you think of London, one of the first things that springs to mind is a black Cab. And the winners of tonight's Voluntary Charity Award, the London Taxi Benevolent Association for War Disabled, are brilliant because of the wonderful service that they provide for veterans. And I was fortunate enough to go along for a ride and see firsthand just how much joy they give. Taxi! The London Taxi Benevolent Association for War Disabled is a unique charity which links veterans with taxi drivers. Taxi drivers like Aaron. So, Aaron, who are we picking up today? We're picking up a gentleman called Jeff Patterson. He's a Second World War vet, 92 years of age. Hello there. 
You Hello. must be Jeff. So, Jeff, tell me, what did you do in the war? Well, I was a parachutist with the Parachute Regiment, and my first operation was um, D-Day on the 6th of June, 1944. The taxi charity was set up by taxi drivers after the war in 1948 who wanted to give their mates who had been injured and wounded in the war days out and outings. And we regularly now take about 130 taxis and up to 300 veterans on our summer outing. Last year we went over to Holland. We went to Normandy and France on various occasions, down to Worthing in Sussex on our annual pilgrimage. The taxi drivers volunteer their time. Without them, we just could not function. So, Jeff, where are we going today? We're off to Chelsea. A tea dance has been organised by the charity. <laughs> Enjoyed they're not just taxi drivers, they're looking after you, they put on functions, we meet people, uh, we surf quite often, we meet old friends we haven't seen for years. Some of these fellows have given up quite a lot, so for me to give up a day or two, it doesn't compare. They're amazing, I mean, if it weren't people like that, that done what they did all them years ago, where would we be today? I would like the taxi drivers to know that everything that you do is fully appreciated by us and we thank you for it very much. Taxi Charity, please welcome Dick Goodwin and Ian Parsons, together with veterans Fred Glover and Geoffrey Pattinson. We'd like to accept this award on behalf of all the veterans who support us and who allow us to do our work and all the London black taxi drivers who, without whom our charity would cease to function. They are absolutely wonderful people, salt of the earth. So the London black taxi drivers and the veterans. Thank you. Lots more to celebrate tonight, including our Special Achievement Award. But our next award of the night is for sport. And to present it, one half of a terrific twosome. And I say one half because, unfortunately, his partner in crime, Sam, is unwell and can't be with us tonight. From Junior Bake Off, it's Mark Rhodes. One of life's most important skills is learning how to swim. But if you're deaf, it can be a real struggle. But thanks to the Deaf Friendly Swimming Project, fortunately, help is at hand. Sam and I went to join in on one of their lessons and saw for ourselves just what a big difference they make. Learning to swim can be both daunting and fun at any age, but if you are deaf or hearing impaired, it can come with a whole new set of challenges. That's why I'm very excited to be in my homeland of Wolverhampton, where kids are taking part in deaf-friendly swimming lessons. You ready to get wet? Am I? Are you? Yeah. Great. The Deaf Friendly Swimming Project is a programme run by the National Deaf Children's Society to help the 45,000 deaf young people in the UK access swimming. We provide training for hundreds of swimming teachers all over England and Scotland to help make their swimming activities more accessible for deaf young people. There's quite a lot of challenges that comes with being in this lesson because most of these kids have hearing aids and they've had to take those out. And there's a lot of background noise as well, isn't there? 
instructors like Sophie are specially trained to take this class, which is brilliant. We're going to play Simon Says. Ready? Right. Simon Says. A deaf friendly swimming lesson is different to a normal swimming lesson because we'll have to use a lot more signs and visual demonstrations and props. The children meet new friends and it's lovely to see them communicate. I can't swim. I didn't want the two boys to follow my lead and not be able to swim, so they've gone off and they've done it. For the children to communicate with me and to see them grow with confidence and to be able to swim, it's really rewarding. Swimming really is an important life skill that all children should get the support they need to learn. Braden started deaf-friendly swimming lessons last year. Just got hearing aids, but he's lip read from when he was very young. He was very apprehensive about going because he's never mixed with children like himself. As well as giving me the confidence to be around other deaf people, it's given me the confidence to be like, to know that I'm okay being deaf, you know, like, to know I'll be able to go out and do more things. They taught him how to dive, they taught him how to life save. Wow. It has given him that boost that he's desperately needed and he does fantastic now. And it's all down to the swimming lessons that's done that. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. From the Deaf Friendly Swimming Project, please welcome Elena Conley and Ashley Scott. <laughs> We are thrilled to have our work at the National Deaf Children's Society recognised through the National Lottery Awards. Lottery funding has been vital in breaking down the barriers deaf young people face when getting involved in swimming. We want to make a huge thank you to everybody who voted for the Deaf Friendly Swimming Project. Thank you. National Lottery funding helped support over 1,300 athletes on their road to Rio. And Team GB's performance made it their most successful games for more than 100 years. <laughs> From Team GB 2016, please be upstanding and give a huge welcome to bronze medalist Christine Ohurugu. Eleanor Barker and Joanna Russell Shan. Taekwondo silver medalist Lutila Muhammad. Kayak gold medalist Joe Clark. From the women's Olympic hockey team gold medalist Hannah McLeod. Gymnast Niall Wilson and Amy Tinkler. Yeah. And finally, show jumping Olympic champion Nick Skelton. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, some of our Team GB Olympic medalists. Yeah. Christine, hey. how are you? I'm very good, thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, did you expect that this time around, Team GB would do so well in Rio? Um, I think it's hard for us going into the games because obviously we're so focused on what we're doing. Um, but it was so great to know that we, all of us individually, helped to contribute to creating the best ever games, or best in a long time. And um, it's, so, it's such a great time to be doing sport right now. And what was the feeling like when you came back home? Oh it's, been, oh, it's been fantastic. What's um, the best thing that's happened to you? The best thing? Do you know what? I just think it's people just being so proud of us. You don't realise when you're so far away from home that people are watching and supporting and really are gripped by what you're doing. You know, for everything that kind of goes on throughout the year, they're there to support you when it really matters. And, you know, that, that 
kind of proudness is just so uplifting. You feel like you've really done something amazing. Well, we're definitely proud of everybody, and I think that deserves a high five down the line. Congratulations <laughs> to everyone. Congratulations. Congrats, 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 congrats. Now, Nick, um, when you got up on the podium, things started to well up. Yeah, what, what triggered that? Besi again, besides winning, what was, what was going through your head? First thing I thought was is relief, really. Like I said, you know, going back so many years, and it's just relief that you finally get there and do it. And then you think of all the things that all the people that have helped you and uh, got you there. You know, I just couldn't, couldn't control it. It was a pretty awesome moment for all of us to watch, yeah. and congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Amy. Thank you. First Olympics. Yeah. yeah. Now you had your GCSEs just before you went to the Olympics. What was more difficult uh, training for, the GCSEs or the Olympics? Um, I think the GCSEs were a lot more stressful. <laughs> <laughs> what does it feel like to be a 16-year-old at the Olympic Games? Yeah, I mean, it was absolutely incredible out there. Um, I mean, all the people that I met, the experiences that I got, it was just amazing. I'm still pretty speechless now. It still hasn't sunk in, but yeah. Well, congratulations to everybody. And we're very proud that you're all here with us tonight. But, of course, the Paralympic Games are well and truly underway. And we're very lucky that joining us right now from Rio are Izzy Bailey and Zoe Newson. <laughs> so, tell us, what's the atmosphere for both of you like right now at the Games? Oh, it's amazing, really. You've got all the people together, so it's quite good to have all the crowd around with us. Izzy, this is your uh, first Paralympic Games. How does that feel, being the first one? It's, it's absolutely incredible. I haven't been shooting very long, um, and I've loved every competition, but this one's just been an absolute dream come true. Now, Zoe, you won bronze in 2012 in powerlifting, and you've uh, just got another bronze in Rio. What does winning two bronze medals mean to you right now? It's a massive achievement, really, and getting all everyone's support with me is amazing. We're very proud of them, aren't we, everybody? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Izzy Bailey and Zoe Newson. <laughs> and with a huge congratulations once again to these fantastic sportsmen and women whose incredible performances in Rio made us a very proud nation. Congratulations, everybody. Now, from Olympic heroes to heroes of the health category, which is in association with Women at Home magazine. And to present this award is a former detective constable turned TV presenter who can often be found on the streets of Britain to help with unsolved cases on Crime Watch Roadshow. Please go wild for Rav Wilding! Now, as a bike fan, I was really excited about visiting the Northwest Blood Bikes, Lanks and Lakes. Now, they are a part of a nationwide group of fantastic volunteers who combine their love of bikes with saving lives. I went to Chorley to meet their chairman, Paul, and some of the other amazing volunteers. The blood bikers really are the unsung heroes of the Northwest. This gang is prepared to drop everything to deliver life-saving blood to where it's needed most. Paul, yes. Rav, how are you doing? Oh, Good to see well, you. Thanks, Good to yeah, see you. That's nice great to meet you. Here. Um, tell me about blood bikes. We transport blood, donor breast milk for premature babies, medication between hospitals through the night or weekends and bank holidays and we do it for free. Tell us, what are the advantages of using the bikes then? During the day in hospital, they have their own transport, but at night, they were using couriers or taxis. So you set this up in 2012. How much have you expanded since then? Well, our first year, we've been called out 800 times. Now we've just passed 25,000 times. Uh, this in, isn't just in four just years? just over four years, yeah. That's massive. We have uh, about 350 volunteers that's amazing. And they pay their own fuel, they pay their own maintenance, the and we get to ride the bikes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very, very exciting. Yep. You're going to show me? Let's go and do it. Let's go. The blood bikers may be biking enthusiasts, but this is no pleasure trip. Although they're not paid for it, their mission is deadly serious. 
I got involved with the blood bikes purely for the simple fact my little sister, two and a half years ago, was diagnosed with liver and bowel cancer. Well, she was pregnant at the time. It was the blood bikers who brought in the blood my niece required, so I became a blood biker purely to say thank you. Are you Bernie? Well, all right. I have a parcel for you for Preston. All right, I'm off. See ya. Well, thank you. Bye. Bye. At the end of the shift, you look how many calls you've taken, and you know, you just hope that you've made a difference. The runs are very urgent, two or three times daily the blood bike has come to us. These guys are just doing something completely altruistic, you know, for the good of the community and the hospital. They work for us out of hours, weekends, nights, bank holidays, whatever the weather, whatever the time of year. So without a doubt they've saved lives for us here. Hiya. Hello. Got delivery for you. Excellent. Thanks very much, guys. Lovely. Thank you. Job done. Job done. We all have the same aims, we all love biking, we all love to help other people, so it's just fantastic. Well, to accept the award from the North West Blood Bikes Langston Lakes, please welcome Lee Townsend and Kevin Sansom. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the 300-plus uh, riders, controllers, fundraisers who volunteer for us, um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to the National Lottery um, for their funding and for this brilliant award. Uh, it's fair to say that we do most of our running around in the dark. Um, so on special occasions like this, it's really nice when somebody turns the light on. <laughs> this one's for Marcel. Thank you. And up next is the award for the environment. And to present it is someone just as dazzling on the dance floor as she is foraging in a field. She's left the wellies at home tonight. Please welcome Country Files, Anita Rani. Aww. Evening, everybody. Now, I love the great outdoors, which is a good thing because I do work on Country File. So when I found out about the winning project, I couldn't wait to visit one of its locations. Grow Wild is a UK-wide project which encourages people and groups all over Britain to make over local spaces and turn them into something truly wonderful. One of their sites is in Scotland and has undergone a remarkable transformation. Have a look at this and see for yourselves. Grow Wild is the brainchild of the Royal Botanical Gardens Kew and it's all about finding a space and doing something amazing with it. At the moment, they've got 350 sites covering a mammoth 3.5 million square metres. And this is one of those transformed spaces. Believe it or not, this is an old waterworks here in Glasgow, but now it's an incredible area for everyone to enjoy. <laughs> Grow Wild is the UK's biggest ever wildflower campaign. We have 270 community projects, then we have 50 youth projects, and then 46,000 other groups, and they've gone on to impact 1.2 million people. That's a lot of flowers. Grow Wild is amazing because it um, helps us reconnect to nature. It's got a fantastic network of different community groups who've got different creative ways of growing wildflowers in odd places. The story of the waterworks, I think, is one of those things that typifies Grow Wild in terms of repurposing and regenerating old landscapes to give them new meaning. What did it look like when you first got here? It was just uh, desolate. There was nothing there. It was just wasteland, basically, you know, barren. And we came down initially, cleared all the area. But the best part of it was when we got the groups of school children in. First time I saw the waterworks, it was um, a bit of a dump, to be honest. It did smell a bit because it was an old sewage area, so it was a bit nasty, but we cleaned it all out and it doesn't smell no more. I feel really proud to be part of making this place what it is today. Grow 
wild support local people, youth projects and ultimately bring communities together. So this really could be done in anywhere that you can just find a patch. Yeah, totally. In urban settings, it works well, like in community gardens, even the side of the road. We're not really limited to how much space people have. It's more about what they want to do with their community to get them involved. Winning the Environmental Award is like a collective thumbs up to all the individuals, the communities, thousands of enthusiastic volunteers across the country. It's amazing, it's humbling. It's a very special thing. Please welcome to the stage Philip Turville and John McFarlane. Thanks to National Lottery players, over three million people have been brought together across the UK with native wildflowers, all at Grow Wild Community Projects led by Kew Gardens. It is a collective thumbs up to all our wonderful groups, our wonderful volunteers. Thank you so, so much. So to come, the final award of the night, which is for special achievement. But up next is the award for education. And our next presenter is a dancer, singer, actress, and celebrity MasterChef champion. Please welcome former Pussycat doll, Kimberly Wyatt. Becoming a parent at any age is not without its challenges. It can be a tough road, especially for teenagers and young adults. Thanks to the winners of the Education Award, Training Opportunities for Young Parents Scheme, or TOYS, Help is at hand by way of the classes they offer to support young women with everyday issues around parenthood. A toys course is in full swing right now. Let's go take a look. Toys is a course aimed at young moms, helping them to feel less isolated by sharing experiences, learning new skills, and breaking free from challenging life circumstances. So today we're gonna to do the session on assertiveness. Would you shout if you were assertive? If you can, yeah. TOYS stands for Training Opportunities for Young Parents Scheme. The TOYS programme is a 30 week programme that runs twice a week. And we cover everything from parenting, domestic violence, drugs awareness, even dental health worker, and a certain and communication like we did today. Would you lie? You wouldn't, would you? So what would you be? Honest. Honest. It's the only project of its kind. It set up back in 1999, it went from strength to strength with young mums and particularly young mums that are hard to engage, who are often isolated within the communities. They don't have any family support. They just come, they're the sheepest people, and they're like, no confidence, so low, don't believe in themselves. And over the weeks, you see them grow. And it's just, it's like a glow, and it's fantastic. So what was life like before toys? Um, I weren't confident. I didn't wear, I used to wear makeup. My hair was quite long, so I used to cover my face up. Were you a quite shy person then? Very timid. Yeah. Uh, I've just come out of an abusive relationship. So I was all, I kept myself to myself. I think a lot of the times when the girls come to you, they think that's it, that's their life, you know, they've just got to accept it. And you show them that that's not it, you know, there's more to them. In the last six months of being with them, I've been able to change my life around. I'm more positive about myself. I'm doing more stuff. I've made new friends. When I see the girls' confidence grow, it's amazing. You feel like a proud mum. It's like proud mum moment. So what's your future plans then, now that you've found your confidence? Thanks to Toys, I've been able to do um, a counselling course. From that, I've been offered to be a mentor for young kids between 11 and 16. Hopefully, I can be able to bring that to somebody else and help some other poor family out. Toys means a lot to me because I see the satisfaction that we get from these young girls and what they've done and what they've achieved and it's fantastic when they're all there at the end of the sessions, at the end of the programme there are certificates and the smiles on their faces. Very emotional. I believe in what I do. And I think seeing that change is fantastic. Oh, <laughs> they got me. From the Toys 
Project. Please welcome Bev Taylor and Elaine Ashford. I want to say thank you to my fantastic team for going that extra mile all the time. They go out of their way to make sure that they're committed and they make sure everything that young parents come to us, they get the support that's needed. And I just hope that this recognition will help people like Toys and like all the other projects here get funding for future projects to help develop projects like this that make a massive difference to people's lives. <laughs> This has been a, a fantastic evening, but it's not over quite yet. There's still the matter of the Special Achievement Award. Tonight, it is going to not one, but two very remarkable winners. They are Len and Yvonne Arnold. For over 20 years, Len and Yvonne have worked tirelessly and selflessly to support something very close to their hearts, gymnastics. Olympic champion Max Whitlock went to meet them to find out more about Len and Yvonne's story. Just watch this. Len and Yvonne are different from other people. They will give you a chance when others won't. It's definitely more than gym, it's, um, it's family. They're just such kind, warm-hearted people. I've never met anyone like them. The gym is their life. That's what they do. That's what they've always done. <laughs> I was the first English woman to win the Commonwealth Medal for weightlifting. Yvonne spotted my potential as a weightlifter and encouraged me into the weightlifting gym. What 12-year-old girl thinks about doing weightlifting? None, as far as I'm aware. I really owe a lot to them. Len and Yvonne are always putting others first to inspire a new generation of athletes. I'm here to let them know that they have won the National Lottery Special Achievement Award. I've got a friend that I want you to meet, actually. What he needs is the Len and Yvonne touch. <laughs> oh, well, we'll do our best, as we'll usual. Best. <laughs> <laughs> you always do. <laughs> There's obviously a reason why I'm here today, because you are now the proud winners of the National Lottery Special Achievement Award. Oh. I'll tell you what, we couldn't have had anybody better than you to present that. Thank you very much. I know it hasn't been easy. Can you explain to me, like, your journey? Yeah, I mean, there were some ups and downs. I remember 25 years ago when we started the club, we, we looked at this old industrial building which had been empty for 10 years. There was no heating, no doors, and that's where we started. What we did was sell our house, moved into to the gym, built a little flat in the gym, and that just gave us a chance to, to, to get it going. Then the lottery money coming in was the difference, and that was like a domino effect, and we landed up with this amazing facility. We just wham jammed. We, we just start at 9 30 in the morning and we close at 9 o'clock at night. And you thought winning two golds was hard. <laughs> <laughs> what they have given up just to be able to keep this centre open is crazy, but that just shows how much they care and how committed they truly are to Europa. I love it here. We try and do a little bit more than just being gymnastics. You care about the kids and you want to see them to have the best fun that they can have and do the best that they can achieve. It's more like a big family. A great big happy family. Ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding for the absolutely incredible Len and Yvonne Arnold. Come on up here. Thank you very much. It's very kind. Yvonne and I would like to say a big, big thank you to, to the lottery. It's an amazing award and we're very honoured and humbled. And we had lots of people who gave up their time. Electricians, plumbers, people, somebody just wanted to come along with a paintbrush. And this new facility that we've got now that you see is really amazing. All yours, Yvonne. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, um, it's organisations like the National Lottery that have helped fund our gym and develop it into the facility that it is now. Um, we're so proud, and thank you so much. 
and um, we've had a really great night. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this very special evening and for voting for your favorite lottery funded projects. I'd like to ask all of the winners to join me on stage now. So please come on up, everybody. Let's go. This has been a wonderful night full of amazing people letting us share in their very special stories. We've had eight fantastic winners. And if any of them has inspired you tonight to do something for your community, then please go to our website for more details. Who knows? It could be you standing right here on this stage next year. Here they are, everybody, your National Lottery Stars of 2016. Thank you, everybody.